Happy birthday, Laser. Thank you, Theodor Maiman, for your invention that changed the world. Welcome, everyone, or probably welcome back. Thanks that you're still with us. We celebrate today the 60th birthday of the Laser, because exactly 60 years ago, on the 16th of May, Theodor Maiman got the first Laser running. So when I say we celebrate this, what does that mean? We are an interaction or a team, a corporation from the PR department of the Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics, the Munich Center of Quantum Science and Technology, and the Photon Lab. We were planning a day of open doors, but it is the corona pandemic and things have changed, so we're doing it digitally. It was a challenge, but here we are. Challenges are something that Theodor Maiman could tell you stories over stories about. He is the father of the laser, but there were so many hurdles in his way on his way to invent the laser because for example, his boss totally did not believe in the laser. He was like, why should you invent this? So he only gave him a little sum of money. You would probably say not enough, but Theodor Maiman got it going and he invented the laser and he was the first in the race to get it running. So thank you Theodor Maiman for that. But that was not all. After he invented the laser, had got it going, he wanted to publish his results in a scientific paper, but nobody wanted to publish it. It took him months until it finally was published. And then in the end, he did not even get the Nobel Prize for it. Imagine someone else got the Nobel Prize for it. It was a theoretician. Um, the reason for that or behind that are quite complex and highly political, nonetheless, Theodor Maiman was the one who got the laser work, and that is what we celebrate today. During one of our live lab tours last week on Instagram, Kay Han thanked Theodor Maiman for the invention of the laser. And that actually is just what we want to do with this event today. Thank you, Theodor Maiman, for your hard work, your stamina, your ideas. Thank you for getting the laser working. In the course of the last week, I called our times the era of the laser quite often. It has become a crucial part of our lives. We use it to measure distances for communication, for diagnostics in medicine and in treatment as well. And we use it especially in science, like on our Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics. Here, the laser is an integral part of almost all our research. During the next two hours, you have the chance to listen to some pioneers of quantum physics. We already have seen Emmanuel Bloch talking about realizing Feynman's dream of the quantum simulator, which was quite interesting and exciting. I learned a lot. I always learn a lot when I listen to these people. So um, before um, we start with this talk, I want to invite you to ask questions because this is a unique chance. These, these pioneers of quantum physics, they mo know more about quantum physics and the quantum cosm than almost anybody else I can imagine. So please feel free to ask questions. Um, write them down in the chat. It's right next to this live stream and um, Tatiana Wilk will be waiting for you there and um, she will forward your question later to the speaker. But now let, I wanna give the floor to Sebastian Blatt who will introduce to you our second speaker, Ignacio Tsirak. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome back. Welcome to uh, the second talk of this uh, afternoon. Uh, we have Ignacio Sirak, and he's going to be talking about quantum computing. Uh, to introduce Ignacio, he's uh, very well known in the community, but if you haven't heard about him, I mean, Ignacio studied physics at the University of Madrid, where he received his PhD in 1991, uh, quickly became a professor, then also at the University of Innsbruck in 1996. Uh, since 2001, he's been the, uh, a director at the Max Planck Institute for Quantum Optics, where he leads the theory division. So today we're celebrating, as you just heard, the 60th anniversary of the laser, but also the 25th anniversary of a paper, very influential paper by Ignacio and his collaborator Peter Zoller, where, uh, they, uh, which lies at the foundation of uh, ion trap quantum computing. And uh, the name Sirac Zoller Gate is uh, very well known in, in the community. So for the last 25 years, Ignacio has been a leading researcher in the theory of quantum science, not only on quantum computing, also quantum communication, quantum gases, quantum many body systems in general. And his work has of course been recognized by many international honors and prizes. 
that includes the Wolf Prize, the Niels Bohr Medal, the Max Planck Medal, and the Mischis Prize, and many others. Ignacio is also a member of the Leopoldina, the uh, German National Academy of Sciences. And today, Ignacio will introduce you to the physics of quantum computers. I'm very excited to hear his talk today. Ignacio, please. So let's see if it works. Okay, thank you very much, Sebastian. And so thank you very much, Miriam. And thank you, everybody, for organizing this. Thank you, uh, MPQ. Thank you, MCQST in Photon Lab. It's a great pleasure to celebrate with all of you this uh, anniversary of the laser. I think the laser has changed our lives and it's affecting all of us. It's affecting very much our research here in this institute. And I want to talk about something that maybe it's not so directly related with the laser, but something that without the laser, it would not be possible. And that's uh, quantum computers. And in fact, so I think that you were following Miriam and Anka during this week, you heard several times that when the laser was invented, it was a problem looking for a solution. So at the time, nobody could imagine that the laser could be used for whatever use, or in particular to build quantum computers. That that's the topic that I'm going to address. Uh, this uh, afternoon. So I have to apologize for if there is any expert attending this talk, but this talk is not for you. It's not for experts. This talk is for people who have not heard about quantum computers or don't know the basics because it's about the basics of quantum computers. Okay, so let me start just with this. That's a, that's a big number and I don't know if you can see it. That's a, a big number and numbers like that, like this one are continuously circulating in the net. So these are numbers that you use when you buy something, you don't notice that, but you buy nothing over the internet, then your credit card is encrypted and some numbers like that appear. And these numbers are also used in calculation with a supercomputer is solving a problem that is going to affect the, the climate or predict the climate or predict some uh, reaction, chemical reaction or some drug design or something like that. There are numbers like these ones here. And so when we have big and big numbers, then sometimes even supercomputers have problems with them. And uh, there has been noticed already many years ago, actually the first person probably who noticed that was Richard Feynman, that if we had a quantum computer, if we had a computer which would work in a very different way that would work just following the basic laws of quantum physics, then maybe it's possible to deal with numbers like that and to do operations that you cannot do with supercomputers and that you will never be able to do with quantum computers. So in fact, during the last three or four years, we have seen in the newspapers, many news like the ones here that IBM, Google, Intel, Alibaba, the EU, the Americans, the Chinese, many people are trying to build a quantum computer and in particular, last uh, October, there was this piece of news in the newspapers in which Google claimed that they have built the first quantum computer that can beat a classical supercomputer. And so that's, that's what I want to talk about today. So I want to talk about quantum computers, so what they are, how do they work? So are they useful for what? And so do we really have them? So do, do we really? have built just already a quantum computer and can we buy it or we'll have to wait for that. Actually, this talk is, will be very, very closely related to the previous talk by Emmanuel. And so you'll see that there will be some overlapping, overlapping concepts and so several things that he already talked about. So let me start just introducing a little bit quantum physics. So quantum physics is something that uh, for people who have not worked with that or have not studied quantum physics, looks something very weird. And uh, actually, this is not so weird. And in fact, quantum physics is a very old theory. It's a theory that is more than 100 years old. So it was first uh, say, discovered in quotes by Max Planck in 1900. And at the beginning, it was used to, uh, to explain some of the experiments that people could not understand with the laws of physics that existed at that time. So at the time, the new mechanics, so the new uh, Newton's law, so how things move. And they knew electromagnetism. So they knew how electrics and magnetic fields behave. 
And also they knew that electric and magnetic fields were responsible of light. So the light is, is thought to be at the time electromagnetic waves. However, there were some experiments which could not be explained with the, with the laws that they had at that time. In Maxwell proposed a very uh, revolutionary concept, say that maybe light is made out of small particles that now we can call photons. And uh, so this actually was a revolution because uh, physicists had spent about 200 years to make sure that light was not a particle, the light was a wave, wasn't like an electromagnetic wave, like a wave that we have in the, in the sea where waves are moving, something similar to that. However, in order to explain this concept, so Max Planck introduced this concept and said, no, no, light are balls, and if you're looking at the light, then these little balls, these photons, are coming to my eye, and this is why I see these uh, uh, the, 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 the objects. And I mean, this started in 1900, and then these heroes that we have here, develop a theory that explained many other experiments, actually all the experiments basically that they could not explain at the time. And uh, so in, you take, now, now we, this theory is very developed and it explains very well from the smallest things that we know from particles, elementary particles, all the way to the materials and the things that are surrounding us in, in, in very big objects. Quantum physics was also a revolution, not only in science, changing concepts about nature, changing concepts about how, what are we made of, but also was a technological, gave rise to a technological revolution. So many of the things that we have around it in electronics or lasers themselves are based on quantum physics. And we have them because people at that time were able to introduce these theories and, to, and, to, uh, and these theories that explain our world and in particular all these devices. However, um, when they developed this theory in the 20s and 30s, when the theories were developing, they noticed that if they wanted to explain these experiments that otherwise they could not explain with this new theory, then there was a price that they had to pay. So because the theory that was behind had uh, very funny predictions, it was telling somehow that the nature was very funny. And uh, so in particular, you probably have heard about the discussions that Albert Einstein and Bohr had many times, and that, I mean, uh, now we have sentences like he doesn't play dice, or God doesn't play dice, you know, that uh, remains from that time. And uh, so this was because this kind of uh, uh, additional properties of quantum physics that were very unnatural. And at that time, so they thought that probably this is because quantum physics is wrong. It cannot be that nature is so weird. But now we know that actually quantum physics is right. I mean, nature is as weird as it predicts. And so what are these weird properties of nature that quantum physics predicted at the time? Well, uh, it's predicted that objects cannot, maybe when you don't observe, don't have their properties well-defined. So if we would uh, extrapolate, so what happens with quantum physics, what happened at the microscopic uh, scale, and it will happen in our microscopic world. So it could happen that if I put a cat in a box and I close the, 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 the box, then it may happen that the, whether the cat is alive or dead is not defined. So until I don't open the box and I don't look at it, then the property of this object, in this case, this cat, is not defined, being uh, alive or dead. Of course, so quantum physics, what it says is that when we don't observe objects in this microscopic uh, world, then the objects notion, uh, lose the notion of properties. So it's like if two parallel universes are developing and growing at the same time in one universe, maybe the object has one property in, at some position and in some other universe, the, prop, the object has another property. So it's a different position. And these are living together. These two universes are living together until we observe. And at the moment that we observe, one of the uh, universes disappear and we have only one universe remaining which the property will define. So of course, this is very weird. And to think that nature is like that, that, that when we don't observe it behaves in a completely different way was very shocking for our pioneers of quantum physics. However, now it's something that is very natural because people are able to do experiments and to check these properties in their labs. And that's nothing that is not surprising. So why we won't look at them then the properties of object of these microscopic objects don't don't are I mean don't have to be well defined. So these experiments don't take place with with cats, of course, because they have to be in the microscopic world, and we understand very well why this has to happen in the microscopic world. But 
uh, happen with some other objects. And these objects are, for example, like magnets or circuits that are microscopic. So for example, we have a magnet as it is represented here. This magnet can have the North Pole pointing up or the, and the South Pole pointing down or the other way around. And so what quantum physics tells us is that in principle, if we have a magnet like this one and we don't observe and this magnet would be microscopic, then it could be in the same, the, uh, both states at the same time. So it could be the North Pole pointing up or down at the same time. It has not defined yet what is the position of the North Pole. And it could also happen in, according to quantum physics, we can have a circuit and it can happen that the circuit, the current is going uh, counterclockwise or clockwise. And according to quantum physics, these objects would be, would be very, very small and we have control about it and we don't observe it, then it could happen that it could have these two states at the same time. So the current is circulating, let's say in one of these universes clockwise and in the other universe counterclockwise. And why do we don't observe these uh, two universes may coexist. So as I mentioned, we don't do experiments with these big objects, we do it with small objects, but actually there exist objects like this, uh, microscopic magnets or microscopic circuits. And a microscopic magnet is for example, an atom. An atom has, is, uh, has a property that is called dipole moment, which is that it behaves like a magnet. So it can be, we call it spin. So it can be uh, a spin up or a spin down. These are two properties of the atom. And, and so this behaves like if we had a magnet and it can be, in spin up, spin down, or in superpositions, something that we write like that in the jargon, jargon of quantum physics. Or we can have also very small circuits, actually superconductors is a very, very, a very, very small scale in which you can also have that their current can go one direction or the other direction. So now we can have many of these objects. So for example, we can have now many of these atoms. You have here a real picture of an experiment either in Innsbruck or in Maryland, they're doing experiments like that in many other places of the world, where you have many of these uh, atoms aligned. So these actually are ions, and each of the atoms can have the uh, spin up or pointing down. And as you see, you have one of these atoms, it can have two configurations, up or down, that we can call zero and one. If we have two, there can be four configurations. We, could, we can have like the configuration zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. If we have three, it can have eight. If we have four, it can have 16. So the number of configurations that we can have, if we have 100 atoms is two to, the, uh, two to the power 100. So that's huge. We have 300 atoms, we can have two to the 300 configurations. And this is a number, such a big number, at least larger than the number of atoms that we have at the whole universe. So you see that according to quantum physics and the fact that the properties of objects are not defined when we don't observe, we can have them in superposition, we can have them doing like many things at the same time. And this number of things grows exponentially with the number of particles that we have with the number of atoms that we have. And the same thing happens when we have a superconducting qubits, qubits or circuits, we have many, many of them, then it can happen in all these configurations. And so that's actually that is in quantum physics, inherent in quantum physics, that the fact that we have superposition when we have many particles then can represent many things happening at the same time. And actually, this is the, the basic idea that uh, a quantum computer has behind and where the power of quantum computers comes is that now, so we can have now again, these, these uh, atoms, and if we want to store information in them, then we can store information in terms of like we're doing classical systems in bits, so we can call if the spin is pointing down, we call it zero. If the spin is pointing up, we call it one. But according to quantum physics, we can have also superpositions if it's a quantum object. And a quantum object, a quantum bit that can have state zero, state one, and superposition, we call it qubit, quantum bit. Or a superconducting qubit, we can also have it in the same way as before. So a quantum computer, what it does, and instead of working with bits like a normal classical computer, it works with quantum bits that can be like a bit, but it can also be in superpositions. And now we can put many of these qubits together and put circuits in such a way that now these superpositions are created or uh, destroyed, no? depending on the same way that it happens with uh, classical devices. And so that's what is represented here. So you can have the qubits that initially they are all of them maybe in state zero with the, in, where atoms in spin down. And now with the interactions among themselves, 
then they can start processing information, processing information. And at the end, what we do is that we measure these qubits, we observe, we destroy the superpositions, we observe something, and people can figure out how by using appropriate interactions among these qubits, appropriate what we call quantum gates, then they can, you can solve problems that you can solve in some other way. So a quantum computer is like a classical computer in the sense that it produces, it has an input, process information and has the, an output that is the solution to your problem. The main difference is that this process in a quantum computer is quantum, is allowed to use superpositions and use this weird property of quantum physics about the fact that the properties of objects are, may not be defined. So if you want to build a quantum computer, what do you need to, to have? Well, first of all, you have to have qubits and uh, many of them then you have to be able to manipulate them. So to make them interact properly such that they can process the information according to the algorithm that you are following, according to the problem that you want to solve. You should be able to prepare these qubits. So to raise the state of the qubits to start like in a pocket calculator and you start with, with zero, you have to put them in zero. And at the end you have to read out the result. And if you're able to do that and your qubits during the whole computation, follow the rules of quantum physics, then you will have your quantum computer. Okay, so there, these are two examples. So for example, in the case of trap ions, this is a real picture of many ions in which they have been isolated in space they, with the vacuum in such a way that they don't interact with anything. They have to be completely isolated because if they interact with something, it's like if this something is looking at them, and therefore it's destroying the superposition. So they isolate them very much, they trap them. And now if you want to perform a quantum computation, so the first thing is that you will put all these atoms with the magnetic moment pointing down. So with the, with these like these magnets pointing down, and then you want to run an algorithm. You start with a laser, shining laser on different ions. And with these lasers, you can manipulate, go from zero to one, from one, maybe to zero, but also superpositions and the combinations of sequences of laser pulses acting on these ions, then we perform the quantum computation that you want to perform. And with superconducting qubits, it's very similar. You have your qubits, this is what is represented here. And these are circuits that allow you to turn on the current one direction, the other direction, or in superpositions. Okay, so we know now what is a quantum computer. So how to build a quantum computer. So now what can we do with a quantum computer? And well, the first thing is that if we had a quantum computer, we were able to build such a quantum computer, I believe that it will have a huge impact in industry and technology. And the reason is that in industry technology, there are big data. There are all these big numbers that I showed at the beginning that uh, are used in many industrial processes, for example. So you want to optimize processes, you want to optimize paths, or you want to learn uh, something, you want to use in machine learning, with artificial intelligence, all this process of data is better done with a quantum computer than in a classical computer. So we had a quantum computer, you could accelerate many of these processes. Also in uh, this uh, quantum computer would have a very big impact in cryptography and blockchain and all that. And the reason is that in, as I mentioned at the beginning, whenever we are sending secret messages, when we are over the internet uh, sending something that is encrypted, the difficulty uh, of for somebody to decrypt it, to read our message, is that they cannot do some operations with these with this big numbers. However, we had a quantum computer, it would be possible to do these operations, and therefore then the security would be at stake. Another application was mentioned in the previous talk would be to describe materials, maybe some uh, chemistry, drugs, uh, and even uh, high energy physics, science. And so it turns out that as Emmanuel was explaining in the previous talk, so you want to describe with a classical computer the systems, you want to predict chemical reactions, you want to predict the behavior of some materials, you want to solve the equations that describe high energy physics, then you cannot do that in general with a classical computer. And the reason is because the resources will have to scale exponentially with the number of particles that you have, the number of atoms that you have in your molecule or the number of particles that you have in your solid. And 
And uh, these resources can be the time for the computation or the memory for your computation. And as soon as we have the order of 20 or 30 particles that we cannot simulate them anymore. However, a quantum computer could do that. And that's probably one of the most interesting applications of a quantum computer. There are some other applications of quantum computers that are a bit more, more weird. And one of them was recently discovered a couple of years ago by some people at Berkeley. And uh, this is that if we had a quantum computer, we could use it to generate certified random numbers. So let me explain what this means. So imagine that you're, uh, you want to play the lotto. And uh, then there is a central unit that is producing a random number. And then, I mean, if it's your number, then you can make a lot of, a lot of money. So, but how can you trust that the, the central unit is producing really random numbers? How do you know that the numbers that this unit is producing have not been produced before, given to somebody else, and this somebody else has then bought the lotto and then won the lottery? So actually, it's impossible to do this, to, to know this in practice with a classical device, because it's impossible to know whether a number that comes is random or has been generated at the moment or things like that. But it turns out that the quantum computer with a quantum computer, there is a uh, protocol that can, in fact, certify that the number that has been produced by a quantum computer is random. So the central unit, if they had a quantum computer, then people could make sure that the numbers that are generated, generated are not fake. And I put another application that's probably the most important applications of quantum computers are to be discovered. So whenever we have a quantum computer, then probably it will be started to be used and people will figure out what can be used for. And that's the situation is very similar to the one that I mentioned at the beginning with the laser, that at the beginning there was a laser, but it was not what it was useful for. And I guess that for a quantum computer, something similar will happen. Okay, so now we learn what is a quantum computer, how, what wonderful things we could do with this quantum computers of how it works, how we should build it. So do we have a quantum computer? What is the present situation? And in fact, now there are uh, many experiments uh, around the world in which they have small prototypes of quantum computers based on trap ions. That's for example, this example is a picture here of the superconductor devices. There are also quantum computers built with photons or with molecules with quantum loss color centers in platinum. Uh, ions also with the system that Emmanuel mentioned in his in his talk. But what changed about three or four years ago is that companies in the industry started putting a lot of effort into building a quantum computer. So I showed at the beginning these uh, pieces of news. And now, I mean, there are many companies that are announcing that they are really pursuing building a quantum computer. And this has accelerated the field, has also increased the enthusiasm of, uh, of everybody. And this is what uh, happened that this led, for example, to this first experiment in which a quantum computer, a prototype of quantum computer was built that was able to do something that a classical computer cannot do. So, but however, these quantum computers that exist so far are not the ones that are able to solve the problems that I mentioned before, the problems in the industry, the problems related to cryptography, the problems related to uh, lottery, the problems, all those. For that, we need other, much powerful quantum computers. And the reason why we don't have these computers yet, that we only have these prototypes, is that there are errors. So I mentioned before that in order to use the laws of quantum physics, then you cannot look at your, uh, at your computer, because if you look at it, then you will destroy the superpositions out of these universes. You, uh, most of them will disappear, and then you will have only one, and you uh, will not be able to use anymore these laws of quantum physics. And so uh, it doesn't have to be me, the one who looks at the quantum computer in order to destroy the, the information there. It can be anybody or anything. So these systems have to be completely isolated because otherwise they will produce errors. And that's the main problem, that whenever we are making them bigger and bigger and bigger, then it's more and more and more difficult to isolate it. That's why, I mean, there is a big challenge now to build such a quantum computer. So the present situation is that did. We don't have a scalable quantum computer, we just have prototypes. This scalable quantum computer would be the one that is able to have all the applications that I mentioned before, but this is a tremendous scientific and technological challenge because we have to learn how to isolate these systems better. There is something that is called error correction techniques that can allow to correct the errors when they happen, but this comes with an overhead that is very big right now, and so it's a very big challenge. So it will take some time until we have a scalable quantum computer. 
There's another uh, type of quantum computer that's the non-scalable quantum computer. So people call it uh, uh, NISC, so noisy intermediate uh, scale quantum computer. These are the ones that are being built now. So they have the order of 50, maybe 100 qubits, but they have errors. And, but the question that even in the presence of error, they may be useful for something. And actually that's what people are figuring out that maybe these uh, small quantum computers can be used to solve some, maybe not all the problems that I mentioned before, some of the problems. So for example, the one that I mentioned about the random number generation or maybe some problems related to, to the solution of some uh, simulation problems. And on top of that, there is a third kind of quantum computer. That's the one that Emmanuel was talking about. This is an analog quantum computer. And these are very advanced and you heard, you heard in the previous talk. And with these computers, you can probably, when you will not be able to solve all the challenges that I mentioned before, but you will be able to, 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 to solve some of the problems related to the simulation, to, to solution of some of these uh, material science problems. Okay, so I'm about to finish, just to mention that there are other applications beyond quantum computation. So we know that also these strange laws of physics can be useful, not only for processing information, but also for transmitting information, for sensing, maybe for metrology, et cetera, et cetera. And so there is a big, international effort going on in many universities and now also in the industry and research centers in order to tame this microscopic world, to explode these properties of quantum physics that are so weird and to use them in different applications. So in summary, I was talking about quantum computers and how good they are, so what useful they would be, how difficult it is to build them. I was also talking about other applications of quantum physics but in summary, we're experiencing a scientific and technological revolution, similar in some sense to what happened many years ago when the first laws of quantum physics were discovered and this brought some technological revolution with it. But probably we know some of the, we know some of the applications, the one that I mentioned, but probably the most important applications are still to be discovered. And so I'll finish with a picture of my department and acknowledge to all the members of the department. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ignacio, <laughs> for this very nice presentation. So um, it's now my pleasure to um, give you um, the questions we have from the chat. Um, and it would be great if you could step a little closer to the camera, actually, um, of, your, of your office, uh, so that the people can, can see you a bit better. Um, okay, so the first question that um, came in uh, is actually concerning the, the time um, um, that we will be needed to build um, to build a real quantum computer that can be useful and um, if, and run efficiently. So, what do you think? What what will be uh, the time scale on what we look forward to? Okay, so let's say for this uh, prototypes of quantum computers that may be useful. I think that in the next, let's say, few years, three, five years, you will have already quantum computers of the order of 100 to 100 qubits working relatively well. I mean, they will not be this universal scalable, but probably we'll find some applications for that. Now, for the scalable ones, or the big ones, the ones that is a big challenge, I think that it's still a long way to go. And um, if you ask me for a date, I would say that more than 10 years. I don't know if less than 30, probably I can safely say that less than 100, but uh, more than 10, probably. Okay, um, and then there was another question also concerning the software of quantum computers. So we we, we uh, talked um, only about the hardware now, but uh, what about the software? So is there um, a development as well? Yes. Okay. So on the one hand, there are algorithms, and so these algorithms exist and being discovered. So every second week there appears a paper in a journal, in a scientific journal, about a new algorithm. So so about a few years out a problem that could be solved with another, with a quantum computer. And, but on top of that, also there are companies like IBM that have opened up their uh, quantum computers to the public. So they put them in the web, in the, in the cloud. And so you can just program these quantum computers when they have developed some software. And so there are companies that are also developing some, 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 some interface such that people who don't know about quantum physics they could still run these quantum computers and whenever they 
can, can be operated or whenever they can be grown and they have less errors, then they can be used by, by everybody. In fact, there are even books. So if we have young, uh, say, uh, students that are thinking about uh, becoming a computer scientist in informatics or something, something like that, one possibility for the future is to become a quantum informatic and to learn how to program a quantum computer. I mean, you can buy a book and you can start learning something something like that and maybe it's uh, i mean these are we take the opportunity also to say that in our munich center for quantum science and technology for these young people we are starting a new master program starting on the on september on quantum science and technology so if there are some students of physics or mathematics computer science with engineering that like to would like to become a, 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 a quantum computer software programmer or hardware making or something like that. They have the opportunity to, to learn it with us. So we'll start after September just uh, uh, giving lectures on, on that topic. Thank you. Um, concerning the software again. So um, is there actually, um, I mean, do people write software for certain implementations of the quantum computer or is the software universal for all um, te technological platforms? That's right. So the idea is that you would like to have a software that is universal in the same way. So it's like an operating system. So when you use your uh, computer, then you have an operating system that works maybe for a PC and you buy a different brand of PC, it works for all of them. And if you buy maybe an Apple, then you have a different operating system. So the idea would have to be to have different operating systems depending on the implementations, but not too much on the implementation such that you could just have different platforms and operate them in the same way. And then of course, there will be the next level, which is not an operating system, but is the program language. And the program language like uh, you know, uh, C++ or Python or Julio or whatever. Okay, so there are people thinking about something like that and compilers and so on. So program uh, probably, I mean, it's still a bit earlier for some of these applications because these quantum computers are not at hand, but um, um, there are people thinking about that, doing that, and there are companies that are basically building all these uh, building blocks for, for software for these uh, quantum computers. Okay, so then there is a question also from a, speci a specialist. Um, so quantum computers are very suitable for NP problems. What industry use cases do you see as perfect candidates? Well, actually a quantum computer is useful for some NP problems. So maybe let me explain what an NP problem is. So mathematicians or computer scientists classify the problems depending on how difficult it is to solve them. So for example, multiplying two numbers, it's simple. I mean, actually you can multiply two numbers yourself and if you give you bigger and bigger numbers or with more and more and more digits, then it takes longer, but just a little bit longer. Just with your computer, you can multiply to one million digit numbers and it will do it right away, it will take a millisecond. And if it's hundred million, it may take one second. So these are simple problems and the class of problems that are like that, that can be efficiently computed with a classical computer in which the, the, the resources only scale sl slowly, mildly, you know, with the number of digits that you have. And this is called the P class. The NP class is the class of problems in which this is difficult, in which this is exponential. Actually, it's, these are problems that is very difficult to, to, to compute, to solve them, but it's very easy to check the solution. So one of these problems, for example, factorization. Okay, factorization is the opposite of multiplication. So if I tell you three and five and multiply them, then you tell me three times five is 15, that's simple. If I tell you the opposite problem, so factorize 15, then you have to tell me three and five, which are the numbers that multiply the 15. If I tell you uh, um, factorize 21 is seven times three, right? And it turns out that this, this problem is a difficult problem. So because if you take longer and longer, and more, more and more and more digits, it becomes very, very difficult to factorize these numbers. And so this is a problem that belongs to NP because it's very hard to factorize, but if I know the solution, it's very easy to check. If I know the solution is three times five, then I multiply and check that it's a solution. And so it happens that a quantum computer finally can solve some of these NP problems, not all of them, yes, few of them, some of them. And so these, uh, these, these problems that are in NP are factorization, logarithm, uh, discrete logarithm, taking logarithms and things like that. And we know a we know few of them. There are some of them that we would like to have algorithms to solve them and uh, actually we don't have. So typical, the typical one is the uh, graph isomorphism. So basically I draw a, a graph 
and uh, I put some points, okay, and I join with lines, some of them, this is a graph. And then I put other set of, of points, and then I draw a graph, so I join some of the points together. And so the question is whether these graphs are equivalent. And equivalent meaning that now I rename, instead of calling this point one, two, three, four, five, if I call these seven, these three, just rename them, that it's exactly the same as the first graph. So are these two graphs the same if I rename just the points? Actually, there is a problem that is in NP, it's very hard. And so people have tried very hard to find a quantum algorithm for that, it would be efficient, but nobody has found it. So with this, I'm, what I'm saying is that there are some problems in NP that we know that a quantum computer can solve. There are some problems in NP that we hope that quantum computers can solve, but there are also some problems in NP that we expect that no quantum computer would solve. And so they are too difficult even for, for quantum computers. <laughs> okay, so then uh, maybe you can also um, let us know a little bit um... So why are the companies like Google and IBM so, so much behind uh, getting the first quantum computer? Well, I mean, first of all, I guess that it's a prestigious thing behind that. I mean, the first who built a computer with uh, I mean, in the history of technology. You know? So I guess that that's part of it. The second is that uh, I mentioned at some point that if we had a quantum computer, that would be important for industrial applications, in particular for optimization problems. To mention this very, very briefly, but for example, imagining this uh, traveling salesman problem. You know? I mean, you have many cities and you have a track and you have to go to all the cities one after each other. And but uh, what is the best, the shortest way? What is the way in which you will uh, consume less gasoline? And of course, you can go first one to one city, then from another, another. And there are many possibilities. Actually, there are many, 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 many possibilities. So that if there are 30 cities, there are so many possibilities that it's impossible to know what is the best one. And actually, a quantum computer cannot solve this problem, we believe, completely, but can do it better than a classical, than a classical computer. And therefore, this would mean that if you have a quantum computer and you have a track, then you will be able to uh, save uh, uh, your gasoline or, or, or optimize it. And the same, uh, there are many optimization processes in the, in the industry. And in particular, if you look at the Google search machine, it's using an optimization process also. And so they will like to use them there. Or if you look at, uh, I mean, I don't know, uh, uh, companies like uh, Airbus or Rapid are, are interested in quantum computers, they also have many optimization processes that if they were able to solve better, then they would have, I think, very, uh, would have very, very positive economical uh, advantages. Okay, so uh, Google in um, last uh, last year and end of last year, Google um, published this um, paper on quantum supremacy, and they demonstrated um, an algorithm or the working principle with um, 53 qubits, I, I think. So, um, do you think that Google is actually ahead now at the moment, or what does this experiment show us actually? Okay, so that's an interesting. So maybe we should we should say here that maybe the the word was coined by John Preskill is probably not, uh, not, uh, not uh, the best one. And so people start calling it quantum advantage, but I think that it went into so much the, the jargon of uh, people that this use without noticing it. Anyway, so, so what, what they did is that what they built in Google is they built a random circuit. So they took 53 qubits. Actually, these qubits were not perfect. So what happens is that they have some of the errors that I mentioned before. And then they apply these gates that I mentioned before. So they make them interact, maybe these two, then 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 these two. And at the end, they measure the, the result of the qubits, whether they have a zero or a one. And it turns out that this, what you do, if you do that with a random circuit, you just choose randomly your gates. At the end, the result will be random. Okay, you will have some time zero, zero, one, zero, zero, some other times, but it's not entirely random. It's, it's kind of random, it's a, it's a little bit not random. And actually what they showed is that it will be very difficult to sample in the same way with a classical computer, because it's very easy to sample something that is completely random. But however, since it's not exactly random, then, I mean, the fact that it's not exactly random is very difficult to do it with a, with a classical computer. And so that's what they say. They say, okay, so we have, uh, 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 you, I pose you a problem. I mean, with a classical computer, sample zeros and ones in the same way as I'm sampling with my quantum computer. And they show that actually it's very difficult, but they can do it. 
And so this is an academic problem. There is, so why do we want to sample something that is almost random, but is not random? There is no application that we know about that. But actually, is one problem that a quantum computer can do. And if you try to do it the same with a supercomputer, they show that it will take many, many, many years. So I have to say that, I mean, Google in some sense is, is leading, but uh, there are other companies. IBM is, I mean, just basically, I mean, products in basically at the same speed. And other technologies like the trap ion technology are also progressing very fast. So we have also uh, prototypes of quantum computers with also the order of 50 qubits. Some of these quantum computers based on ions are even better than the, the, the ones in Google's. And so, I mean, that's something that is currently developing. And that's uh, something that is very good to have in mind that there are many technologies that we don't know which one will be the winner. So which we have in 10, 20 years, a quantum computer will be based on trap lines, superconducting qubits, maybe in semiconductors, or we don't know. Probably it's none of the above. So it will be a different technology that we have not uh, thought about yet. But nevertheless, I mean, at the time that we are progressing and developing and improving these technologies, actually, I'm sure, and people are sure that there will be some other applications beyond quantum computation that will become interesting. So Emmanuel mentioned atomic clocks and sensing and so on, but there will be some difficulties. You look at the, at, at the history of science, that was has, what has happened before. So at the beginning, you discover something and you use, you think that it's useful for something, but actually it turns out that it's useful for something that has absolutely nothing to do with what you thought at the beginning. An example is the laser. And uh, we hope that in the race to be the quantum computer, something like that will happen. And that's why people call that that's a revolution. So what we do is that we are able to pass the frontier, to cross the frontier of the microscopic world. We have new laws in our hands. We start just touching them. We start just seeing, oh, it can be applied for something. But probably when they start combining in the different ways, then we will find some applications that at the moment we don't know. Okay, so there was another question actually concerning the uh, interconnection between quantum computers. So um, will quantum computers use quantum key distribution, for example? So, or how actually do they communicate? Yes, so actually there are people working on that in our institute. There is a, a group who is working on how to connect quantum computers and to have a quantum internet. And uh, actually, so the idea is that, of course, if you have a quantum computer, you want to connect with another quantum computer, you don't want to just measure your quantum computer and send some let's say, classical information to the quantum computer because you will lose the properties of the superposition. You would like to use these qubits also through your, let's say, fiber or, or whatever. And that's why people like, like in our case, Lehar Rempen and his, and his team are just working on how to couple, let's say, the qubits, these atoms, ions that I was talking about with photons that will go through fibers, will go to some other quantum computer and then they will uh, there I mean, interact with some other atoms, and in this way they will make uh, they will uh, send information from one place to another one. And in particular, this may be interesting in the context of cryptography. So I didn't mention it here, just yes, very briefly at the end. So quantum uh, physics can be used not only let's say to break uh, encryption methods, but also provides a new way of encryption based on quantum physics that cannot be decrypted not even by quantum computers. That's what, uh, I mean, the basis of that is what is called quantum key distributions. And these quantum computers, whenever they exist, they probably will use not the normal encryption methods that we use, but they will use this quantum key distribution in order to encrypt their messages. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, actually, we run now um, out of time and uh, I would like to thank you again for your great presentation. And now I hand over to Miriam again. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ignacio Sirak, and thank you, Tatiana. Look, I want to mention, since this is the anniversary of that paper, Quantum Computation with Cold Trapped Ions, 25 years of Ignacio Sirak and Peter Zoller already thinking about quantum computers, we already had a talk yesterday, which was the real date of the publication in the physical review letter. And um, thank you, Ignacio, for giving us so much time yesterday already and again today. Um, so congratulations to 25 years of that paper and of thinking and developing quantum computers. Um, so uh, if you're interested in that talk as well, if you like this, just check it out on Instagram. Our Instagram name is 
at Max Planck Quantum. And if you go on IGTV, you can watch that um, talk from Ignacio Tirac and Flora Kunst. So yeah, that would be lovely if you are interested. Um, so before we start the next talk, which will be in another stream again at 4 p.m. Um, and it will be Joachim Pupetza, the Symphony of Molecules. I still want to point out again that there will be a quiz on Kahoot and it will not work in the YouTube stream. So if you want to join us, if you want to have a realistic chance to win one of our, I find, pretty cool Corona facial masks, um, then please join us on Zoom. There is a link underneath the last live stream that you can see today, which is the quiz. It is actually um, named the quiz in English. So please um, then click on the link, download Zoom in case you don't have Zoom yet. Yes, we know nobody wants to download new stuff, but the master quiz, aren't they? I'm looking forward to having my own one as well. So um, yeah, if you're interested in that, please download Zoom and then join us there at 5 p.m. Um, the questions will be about all the talks and the lab tours of the last week. So um, it is the tiny URL thing um, with laser quiz minus English. Um, it is really simple. So don't worry about downloading. You just need to download it once and then it will work in your browser and then you can join us. Um, and the quiz really is fun. But that is enough for now. I see you again, hopefully, in about 10 minutes. Uh, 